What's up, people? It's your boy, Jew, coming at you guys um, with yet another edition of What's the Word, Dirty Bird. Uh, we do this every Tuesday um, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, sometimes we go for about an hour, 30 minutes, um, but I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Um, I'm back. I missed last week because I was really busy, um, but we back as like we never left. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different things uh, today that I want to get into. Of course, Falcons news. I want to get into some NFL draft talk. We're about two, or two to three weeks away from the NFL draft. Um, I think about 16 days away from the draft. So I'm super excited that the draft is right around the corner. So we're going to talk about that. And of course, we're going to do some fan Q&A. So I'll take you guys questions, as I always do uh, in the chat and things of that nature. Um, but I hope you guys are having a great week so far. Um, I hope you guys, um, you know, all are doing well. Um, I'm definitely doing really well. Uh, this Thursday is my birthday. So as you guys know, I mentioned uh, I am an Aries and also my wife is an Aries. Her birthday was last Thursday. Um, and me and my youngest son share the same birthday, April 11th. So, yes, I'm looking uh, looking forward to my birthday, looking forward uh, to having a blessed birthday and a blessed uh, bless, uh, rest of this week. But with that being said, I'm going to jump into the chat. Just say what's up to you guys. Um, if you haven't already, uh, when you came in, hit that like button for your boy. Hit that like button. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button for your boy as well. Um, but I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Um, and we got Miss Pam bright and early here. She was the first one in the chat. She says, good morning, Jew, everyone in the chat. So what's going on, Auntie Pam? I appreciate you uh, being in the chat. And she uh, does her thing with the Lady uh, Dirty Birds. So Y'all check them out on AFN's channel. Um, what's going on, Sherman Wood? What's good, family? He said, what's going on? I hope you're having a great week as well. And what's up to my bro? Uh, one third of the heavy hitters. Uh, Mad Mike Sports, y'all definitely go to his channel as well. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button. I think he's shooting for 10K. We on our road to 3K, so y'all definitely go show him some love as well. And Dre Murphy, what's going on, bro? He says, uh, hello, everyone. How's everyone doing and feeling on this chilly, <laughs> uh, cloudy, rainy, wet Tuesday morning? Yeah, I'm in sunny Florida, so I I'm sorry to hear that it's raining there, but we're having a really nice uh, day it's in the 80s uh here in central florida and i thank you for that miss auntie pam she says happy related birthday to you and your wife jew i appreciate that and red swarm he says what's good brother jew and everyone in the chat happy birthday aries my birthday is april uh april 5th also you also are aries so happy birthday man yeah, your birthday just passed you born one day uh after my wife my wife is april 4th so what's going on, Miss Sonia How? What's going on? I hope you're doing well. I thank you for joining me as well. And let's see here. Xavier Littman, what's happening, man? I appreciate you joining as well. So as I mentioned, as you guys come in, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button for your boy. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. But we're going to jump right into uh, some Atlanta Falcons news because we did have some news drop yesterday um we had two signings yesterday so first kevin king uh signed with our atlanta falcons um he is the cornerback formerly of the green bay packers i um, mean i really think that this is a a really good signing a sneaky signing by the atlanta falcons a lot of people are kind of just brushing it off like uh, he'll just be a role player or he'll just be a guy that um you know probably just add depth to this atlanta falcons team but i think he could have a significant role uh, depend uh, depending on how healthy he is uh, because he's been out of the game for two years um you know he hasn't played since 2021 but he's only 28 years old uh, he's 6'3 200 pounds I did a video yesterday on him uh, as far as Atlanta Falcons news but I think that this is a really good sign and especially because we signed him to like a one-year deal for I think like around one million dollars so it's not really a um you know, one of those big name or splash signings that I think the league is going to really talk about. But I really think that he's a guy that could add not only depth, but I really feel like he's going to push the cornerbacks that are currently on this team. So guys like um, Clark Phillips, guys uh, like Mike Hughes that's still on this roster, he's going to push those guys for that second uh, corner position. And we know because Raheem Morris is cut from that Dan Quinn or he coached with Dan Quinn, 
He likes to run a lot of zone coverages and things of that nature. We know that Dan Quinn preferred longer cornerbacks, guys that were six feet and above. And one thing that um, Kevin King has over guys like Clark Phillips um, is he has that length. Um, even a Mike Hughes, he's six three, so he has that those long arms, uh, similar to a Richard Sherman, similar to a Brandon Browner in that Seattle Seahawks, you know, in that secondary, the Legion of Boom, how they like those bigger, longer physical cornerbacks. And I really feel like Kevin King is one of those guys that's uh, sneaky good. Like I was surprised that he hadn't played in the league in uh, the last two seasons, and I'm surprised that the Green Bay Packers didn't re-sign him because he's one of those guys that I think is a solid corner in the league. Um, as I mentioned, you guys know that I'm not um, huge on you having to have the top of the line cornerbacks. Um, I am a fan of the cornerback position. Uh, the cornerback position is actually my favorite position in the game of football because Deion Sanders was my first favorite player when I first started watching football many years ago um, as a child. But you guys know that I believe in building in the trenches, building from front to back. So if you have a good pass rush, if you have a good front seven um, and you limit the quarterback's time to see down the field, I really feel like you can have cornerbacks that are just average or a little bit above average and you can win a lot of football games. So I think Kevin King is one of those guys that's kind of went over everybody's head where they're like, oh, he's not that big, of, you know, that good of a player because he hasn't played in the last two seasons or you know, this is not a big signing for the Atlanta Falcons, but for the money that we paid him and for what he did with Green Bay, pretty much being their number two cornerback for the most of the time he was there behind uh, Jair Alexander. Um, I really feel like he's one of those guys that's a really, really uh, solid cornerback. Now, yes, he didn't, um, you know, he didn't have put up the best numbers when he was with Green Bay, but I really feel like a lot of the issue was he was targeted a whole lot because most teams were not going to try Jair Alexander, similar to what has been happening with A.J. Terrell on our roster, where I mentioned previously that teams won't even try to challenge A.J. Terrell. Majority of the times, they'll go after our number two or our number three corner. So I really think that Kevin King is one of those guys that's right there with a Jeff Okuda. Uh, we know last year Jeff Okuda was our number two cornerback, and then later on in the season, Clark Phillips was that guy that was playing the number two corner. But I really feel like uh, Kevin King is a guy that's going to push these young guys on this team. So I wouldn't count him out. I wouldn't be shocked uh, if game one, Kevin King is that number two corner on the outside. I, it wouldn't surprise me because he's a guy that's familiar uh, with the scheme as far as he played under Jimmy Lake um, when he was in college with the Washington Huskies. And then he also played under uh, Jerry Gray, who was our uh, one of our defensive coaches in the secondary. So I wouldn't be surprised if Kevin King was one of those guys that not only came in here and played really well, but also a guy who can rub off on these younger guys and kind of help groom these guys. Because as you guys know, you know, we lost our defensive coordinator and Ryan Nielsen last season. So he's going to get these younger guys in that secondary up to speed on what, you know, Raheem Morris, what Jimmy Lake, what they're looking for uh, out of this scheme. So it's always important. Um, when you're bringing in a new coach, we know that they always bring over players from former teams that are familiar with their scheme. And that's mainly to just uh, shorten or cut uh, short the learning curve, because we know anytime you bring in a new, you know, a new scheme, a new coach, there's a learning curve for a lot of these players, especially we have a lot of young players, especially in the secondary. So having a guy in Kevin King not only is going to benefit our team like on the um defensive side of the ball and as far as his play but also in the classroom or in the film room he's going to be a guy that's going to help these young guys with the learning curve or learning you know learning uh the system but with us bringing in kevin king of course i mentioned this in my video as well that i did yesterday i still think the falcons are going to bring in a cornerback in the draft which we'll talk about so i think it'll be probably like in the second or third round could happen in the first round but I don't I really think that the Falcons are going to go edge. Um, but if they decide to go with a cornerback, you know, in the draft, um, you know, I, it could be between rounds one and three. I think the Falcons might select at least one or two corners in this draft. And that'll be to push these guys that are currently on the roster, because I don't really think um, the guys that are here, the Clark Phillips, um, the Mike Hughes, all of these guys were here prior to this coaching regime. 
So, you know, nobody at this point is safe is what I'll say. And Red Swan says, I like the Kevin King edition, Jew. It is truly a low risk, high reward deal. Has a whole lot of, of familiarity with so many of the off, excuse me, defensive coaches. Right. Most definitely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's a great pickup because he's familiar and he's a really he was a pretty good player with the Packers. Like if you go look at his film, if you go look at when he was with Green Bay, he was actually a, a really productive player um, with the Packers. So I was surprised that he didn't play in the last two seasons. Now, I did hear uh, rumors and I haven't done my research, but I have heard rumors that he was injured the last couple of years. So maybe that's the reason why he wasn't, um, you know, playing NFL football. And Kenneth Lewis says, good morning, Jew and the entire AF fam. What's going on, man? I appreciate you joining me. And let's see. And Dre Murphy says, me personally, I like and love Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. I don't like Clemson, but I do like him. Yeah, most definitely. Nate Wiggins is a guy I did a, a prospect um, video on. He's out of Clemson. He reminds me a lot of A.J. Terrell, long, athletic, wiry, a uh, guy that's really fast and a guy that can make plays on the football. And I really feel like playing in this new Jimmy Lake scheme, it's going to be a lot of, um, you know, zone pressures. I think it's going to be more man, uh, less man to man and more zone coverages, which, to be honest, I like man to man um, in a mixture of zone. I think we're going to have to mix it up. But I think in um, this particular scheme, we're going to see a lot less man-to-man -man coverage that we've seen last year out of Ryan Nielsen because Ryan Nielsen likes to run a lot of man-to-man -man coverage and, you know, send blisses and things of that nature. But I don't think last year, and I mentioned this in my previous shows, I don't think that Ryan Nielsen blitzed enough last season. Even though we ran a lot of man-to-man -man coverages, I wanted to see a little bit more aggression out of our defense, especially at times when the game was on the line. Um, in some of those last drives, like against the Arizona Cardinals, when they went down and scored that game winning drive, I felt like we should have put a little bit more pressure on Kyler Murray and sent pressure with guys that can get to the quarterback and keep the quarterback contained. So if you look at uh, teams like the Kansas City Chiefs, they will blitz their cornerbacks to make sure a scrambling quarterback don't break contain. Where well, I feel like last year we had times where Bud Dupree, um, you know, Arnold Epicady, even Calais Campbell at times, those guys were not either not athletic enough to keep the quarterback contained or they lost their leverage and allowed quarterbacks to scramble. In like two or three games last year, we lost the game because we didn't contain the quarterback. Um, the game against the Vikings with Josh Dobbs, he ran all over the field. In the game against Arizona, against Kyler Murray, we allowed those guys to use their legs. And that was kind of the backbreaker in those games where those should have been games that the Falcons should have won, but we didn't do a good job of, for one, to me, scheming, you know, bringing guys and putting guys in positions where they could keep the quarterback contained. And then for two, the guys not doing their job, guys going inside, Estella keeping that outside contained. Um, in that game against Arizona, I put that on AK. That was not on coaching. He had them dead to rights, and for whatever reason, he lost contain, you know, chasing uh, Kyle Murray around. And let's see here. And Red Swan, uh, Dre Murphy says, Red Swan, heck no, to no, 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 to Jamal, injury prone Adams. Me personally, give me Justin Simmons over Jamal, injury prone Adams, bro. Just my opinion. Yeah, I didn't see that um in here, but I have seen I have seen a couple videos where um different content creators have been talking about Jamal Adams, but I really think Jamal Adams, um, he's kind of gotten out of shape. Like Jamal Adams was one of those guys when he was with the Jets, he was one of the top safeties. And it's like after he got that big contract, he had a couple injuries. And then if you look at the player that he was and um, you look, you look at his build when he first came in the league, he was one of those guys that was like one of the top premier strong safeties. And after he got injured to me, he didn't do a good job of keeping himself, keeping himself in shape. So at this point, Jamal Adams is dang near a linebacker. If you look at the way that he plays the game, he's like a box safety, but mainly a linebacker. If I were to bring in a guy like um, Jamal Adams, I would make him a linebacker. But if we were going to bring in Jamal Adams, we might as well bring back Keanu Neal because I feel like Keanu Neal and Jamal Adams are similar players. 
but Keanu Neal is, I believe, is younger than Jamal Adams. And to me, they're around, they're like the same player. I just think Keanu Neal is just in better shape. But if you just want a hard hitting safety, somebody that's going to fly around, similar to like a linebacker and play that physical style football, you you might as well just bring back a, a guy in Keanu Neal. But personally, I don't think that uh, Jamal Adams is one of those guys that the Falcons will bring in. But if they did, he's a linebacker at this point. He's not really a guy that can cover a whole lot, especially not out in space because he's gained a lot of weight. And then he's not a guy that was never really a great coverage safety in the first place. He was a guy that was more uh, the hammer. He was physical. And what's going on to my bro? One third of the heavy hitters, six men in the building. Y'all say what's up to six men. Y'all definitely go hit that like and subscribe button on his channel as well. But with that being said, um, I also want to mention in the Atlanta Falcons news, um, we did bring in also the defensive end out of the from the Washington Commanders, uh, James Smith Williams, I believe his name is. He goes about 6'4, 265 pounds. And I think that this is a depth signing for the Falcons. I did go take a look um, at a little bit of his highlights and stuff like that. And just from what I took from looking at his film, he's a guy that's. Um, like a physical uh, physical specimen in the trenches. He's one of those guys that can uh, play with his hand in the dirt or uh, play on the edge in that two-point stance. Um, one thing I like about him is he has size, though. He's a guy 6'4", 265, long arms. Uh, he's not the most athletic guy um, as far as if you're going to use him to try to contain quarterbacks on the edge, but he's very good at setting the edge in the run game. And he's a guy that hustles. He makes a lot of hustle plays. If you go look at um, his highlights and his film and stuff like that, he's pretty good with the handwork. He has a couple of swipe moves with his hands. Um, and he's a guy that makes a lot of plays uh, in the backfield against the run. And then he got he hustles um, and makes plays on the edge. He had a couple of sacks with the uh, Washington Commanders over his three or four years there. He had about seven sacks uh, with the Washington Commanders. But he is one of those guys that I think will be um, like a rotational uh, guy that the Falcons will rotate in. But I really feel like these two signings of Kevin King and James Smith Williams, these pickups are mainly depth pieces. As I mentioned before, um, the Falcons, because we don't have a ton of money as far as cap space left, I really feel like the Falcons are going to be signing a lot of players to one year deals um, to basically uh, save some of the money for the guys that we're going to have to sign once we draft our players. So, once this draft uh, draft class um, is paid, I really don't feel like there's going to be a ton of money left over um, because we kind of gave the bag to Kirk Cousins and because we have, you know, guys that are making big money. We paid Chris Lindstrom last year. We paid Caleb McGarry. I really feel like at this point, you know, the, the Falcons um, are going to have to be very careful on how they spend their money. So I feel like that's another reason why A.J. Terrell hasn't be, uh, been re-signed just yet is the Falcons are probably trying to wait until closer to after the draft to kind of figure out how much money we really still have left. And I really feel like the Falcons are trying to do their due diligence and be wise on how they spend the money because we know in the last regime, when we paid Matt Ryan, we paid Julio Jones, paid Jake Matthews and those guys, Basically, at that point, we were, we were having to restructure guys every single year, which basically is just pushing or kicking that can down the road. And it's, it's basically just going to have a larger cap number in later years. So I feel like the Falcons are trying to get away from doing that. I really feel like the Falcons are um, trying to make do with some of these one year deal type situations. And they're trying to spend the money as wisely as possible and trying to squeeze the orange. So try to get as much out of each and every player that you can. And that's why I always talk about player development is huge. Like you have to develop the guys that are on your roster. Um, we need guys to take the next step. Guys like DeMarco Hellams from last year, guys like Clark Phillips, uh, guys like Zach Harrison, all those guys we drafted last year that got a lot of playing time. We're going to need those guys to continue to develop and get better and better. At um, And if those guys get better and better, then it'll make it a little bit easier uh, on the cap because at that point, you will have some of these guys that we brought in in the draft become starters instead of, you know, second string guys where we still trying to go out and pay guys to come in and be and be starters. So I think the Falcons have done a pretty good job in bringing in 
you know, players. Um, Terry Fontenot in the front office has done a solid job of trying to put weapons around Kirk Cousins with the Rondell Moores and the Darnell Mooney signing. And I really feel like they've solidified the offense for the most part. I really feel like this draft is going to come down to um, building the defense and trying to solidify the defense. But with that being said, I'm going to jump back into the chat really quick. And then we're going to jump into the next uh, segment, which we're going to talk about the NFL draft. Um, but before I do that, let me jump into the chat because I know a couple of you guys have joined uh, since I've been talking. So what's going on, J. Diaz? He says, what's going on, Jew? I appreciate you joining. And y'all can start dropping some of your questions in the chat as well as I'm talking because you guys know I try to limit it the show to like an hour, hour, 30 minutes. Uh, but I know you guys have questions as well. But I want to jump into some NFL draft talk. So. In this NFL draft, as I mentioned, it's a couple weeks away. Um, personally, I've zeroed in on the edge position. Um, I definitely feel like the Falcons have to come away with pass rush in this first round. I don't want to see the Falcons trade back unless, for some reason, all of the quarterbacks go in the top couple picks and wide receivers and things of that nature, and you still have sitting on the board Latu, you still have sitting on the board Dallas Turner, you still have sitting on the board um, – Jared Verse. If all three of those guys are still there and the Falcons decide to trade back, I'll be fine with it. But if your guy's there, I feel like in this draft, the Falcons have to go ahead and take that edge at eight. We don't have time to waste. Um, you guys know I've been stating this probably since the, the last season ended. It's like the Falcons are going to have to fix this pass rush. Last year, I think we did a good job um, of being solid in the trenches. We had 42 sacks where the previous season, I believe we only had about 19 or 20. So we doubled up the sack numbers, but I want to see the Falcons go out and get a guy that can beat, you know, win one-on-one -on -one situations. So even when Grady's not forcing a double team, even when David Onyemata and those guys are not wreaking havoc, when it's third and long, I feel like the Falcons need one of those guys on third and long situations. When it's mano we mano, you versus the left tackle, you versus the right tackle, we need a guy that can consistently win in one-on-one -on -one situations in the last couple of years i'll say probably within the last 10 years the falcons really haven't had that guy that can win mano we mano big time pressure situations third and long the falcons need to get off the field and that showed last year in those games that were one possession games the games that i mentioned the minnesota vikings game the arizona cardinals game um all of those games where it was you know game winning drives the Falcons proved last year that we didn't have that finisher. We didn't have that guy that's going to say, I'm going to put this game away, similar to Aaron Donald, who just retired. If you guys remember in the Super Bowl, uh, Joe Burrow goes back to pass, last drive of the game, um, and Aaron Donald comes away with a sack. That's what we need for our Atlanta Falcons. We need that guy that can consistently win one-on-one -on -one situations that can be a game wrecker. And I really feel like the Falcons have been missing that for the last decade. We haven't really had a guy that can force, you know, game winning situations. They can go out there and make a sack, get a strip sack fumble. And we need that um, this year. Now, I don't want to put a ton of pressure on whoever we draft to say that they're going to be that player this year for our Atlanta Falcons. But we have seen guys like Michael Parsons over the last year, you know, last couple of years, guys come out and, from day one, when he stepped foot on the field, Michael Parsons has been one of those guys that gave the Cowboys 10 sacks a season. So I really feel like the Falcons need to be looking for that player that can be a game changer. And I really feel like the top three guys that we mentioned or we continue to mention, Latu, Verse, uh, Dallas Turner, I feel like those three guys have the ability to be game changers. Now, I'm not going to say all three of those guys will be great pass rushers in the NFL will be consistent enough to be considered with the Max Crosby's be considered with the TJ Watts. But I feel like the mistake that the Falcons have made over the last, I'll say 10 years is just making the assumption that we'll be able to find a gym in the later rounds. Even when we drafted Arnold Epicady, it was like, yeah, you traded up, but you waited to the second round instead of using your top draft pick and going after one of those premier guys. And I continue to say it, and I'm going to keep saying it until the Falcons <laughs> change their ways. 
if you look at any of the past rushers that the Falcons was, you know, were sought after in free agency, the Daniil Hunters, first round pick, the, um, you know, any of the ones you can think of outside of Max Crosby, all of the guys, the TJ Watts, all of the guys that you consistently see having 10, 15 sacks, 20 sacks in the season, all of those guys were first round picks. So I really feel like the Falcons' biggest mistake that we've made over the last couple years is making the assumption that our scouts are good enough to find a Max Crosby when it's been proven that we haven't been that great at drafting guys as far as edge guys in the later rounds. Yes, Zach Harrison played well last year, but I, I can't state that he's going to be a guy that's going to get you 10 sacks in a season. So I really feel like the Falcons – are going to have to zero in just how we do with the wide receiver position over the last couple of years where we drafted Julio, we drafted Calvin Ridley. Uh, a lot of the fans are looking at the Roma Doomsdays, the Malik neighbors. I feel like defensive players hold that same weight. If you go out and you, you know, value that position and put, you know, the first round value on those positions. And I feel like we just haven't done that for whatever reason, you know, the Falcons haven't consistently, believe that we can find somebody in the first round or they don't feel like that position holds that kind of weight. But I feel like we have to change our thinking when it comes to drafting in the trenches. You have to build through the trenches. If you see the teams that consistently win, teams that are consistently in the playoffs, the Philadelphia Eagles, um, you know, all of the different teams, the Pittsburgh Steelers, any of those teams that you look at that are consistently winning, it's the teams that consistently draft guys high in the you know high in the draft and consistently every single year they're drafting defensive players in the trenches in the top first two rounds every year the eagles take a defense alignment so much so they literally went jordan davis then they turned around and went and got jalen carter the year right after that so if if they're not giving you the blueprint you know and showing you how to consistently win I don't know, you know, I don't know what else to say, you know, at this point. I just feel like the Falcons have to change their line of thinking when it comes to defense in, in general. I really feel like a lot of us as fans, we kind of are forgetting that, yes, the Falcons had a solid defense last year, but we don't have the same coaches uh, here. We don't have Ryan Nielsen here with that scheme. So to just assume that the Falcons are going to have a good defense this year, I'm not going to make that assumption. I'm going to bring out, bring as much talent in as possible to make sure that this team can succeed on the defensive side of the ball. Because last year's defense was one of the better defenses that we've seen in Atlanta in a long time. And even last year, we didn't have a dominant defense. Our defense was good, but I feel like it could be better if you continue to build on what we did last year. And we also lost a lot of key pieces. Calais Campbell, as I mentioned before, still unsigned. Bud Dupree still unsigned, which were your top two, you know, pass rushers last year. So we lost some key pieces to this Atlanta Falcons defense to the puzzle. Now you have Grady Jarrett coming back. You have David Onyemata coming back from injury. So you're solid uh, at that nose position and at that three tech position, but you're still going to need to bring, bring in probably two more edge guys. And you're probably going to need to bring in another DT. Now, I do believe we still have, uh, Lakel London as well still on this team and I think he played really well and then I forgot we did bring back uh Contavia Street who's also really good so really we just need to bring in edge edge is the main position that I really feel like the Falcons got to fo focus on uh, in this draft edge and in the secondary those are the two positions that I think the Falcons are probably going to have to double up on they're probably going to have to take two corners in this draft they're probably going to have to take two edge guys in this draft And Dre Harrison says, Jew, if the defense this year is ranked below 11th overall, is the defense a failure? Um, I don't think it's a failure if the defense ranks below the top 10, but I need this defense to get turnovers consistently, and I need the defense to make plays when they're presented. Um, I really feel like last year the defense was good, but in games sometimes when it was, you know, win or go home, when it came down to the last drive, you can't allow the Arizona Cardinals to march down the field and score a touchdown for the game winning drive. You can't allow the Minnesota Vikings with a backup quarterback to drive the, the length of the field and go score a touchdown. 
those are games where your defense has to step up and close out games. Like we always want to point to the quarterback, point to the offense that about game winning drives. But sometimes the offense is going to go down. They're going to make a play. They're going to score a touchdown and take the lead. But then they're going to need the defense to step up and get a turnover or step up and go for and out and win the game that way. And it was just too many instances last year where the defense, they played well, but it was just like in too many instances where the game was on the line, they allowed the game, you know, allowed the opposing team to score game winning drives. And you can't have that. You got to pick each other up. We talk about this, you know, time, time and time again, where there were times where Tom Brady with the Patriots, the defense would make a play or Tom would drive down the length of the field, you know, and, and put them in field goal range to win the game or drive down the field and get a game winning touchdown. And that's what I really feel like um, is missing with the Atlanta Falcons, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And sometimes even on the offensive side of the ball is we haven't made those game winning plays. Like I, I can really care less of the defense is top 10. What I really care about is can you get timely stops? Can you make plays when it really matters? And that's why I say you have to have guys like on the defensive side of the ball as edge rushers, you got to have guys that can win consistently mano a mano. When it's third and long, that's what you pay edge rushers for, to get after the quarterback to make sure either it's a sack, the ball is tipped, but we can just allow the quarterback to have all day to throw the ball, especially with the rules that the way that they are. You can't expect your, your secondary. I don't care how good your secondary is. They're not going to be able to hold up for six, seven, eight seconds while the quarterback's back there patting the football. Um, you know, if you give quarterbacks that much time, especially in the NFL, usually it's going to end bad for the defense when the quarterback has all day to throw the ball. But with that being said, let me jump back into the chat. Red Swarm says, also, it seems like reports have increased that the, uh, the last couple of days about Calais. Man, I really hope that uh, he decides to come back this year, rise up. To be honest, I think Calais will come back. Um, but I really feel like if he does decide to come back, I feel like this is the perfect situation. Like last year, he talked about the Falcons. The reason he joined our team was because he felt like the Falcons um, in 2022 was a team that was really close to being a playoff team. And I really feel like this year, I feel like he would be coming back to a better situation because we have Kirk Cousins, who is an established quarterback, and then you've given him even more weapons. And we know what guys like Kyle Pitts, we know what guys like Drake London, we know what guys like B. John Robinson are able to do. So I feel like um, in this situation for Clayes, I really feel like the offense um, – you know, will be even better this year because I feel like Kirk Cousins makes every single person on this Atlanta Falcons offense better. He makes the guys on the offensive line better because he can make checks and calls at the line. He's seen any defense you can really throw at us. Um, you know, he has all of the weaponry. He has the running backs. He has the wide receivers. He has the tight ends. So I really feel like if Clayus wants to come back for one last, you know, the last uh, dance, as they say, if he want to come back for one last season, I really feel like this would be the perfect situation. I feel like last year he came back to the uh, came to the Falcons on potential, but I feel like this Atlanta Falcons team is even better because you know he's played against Kirk Cousins, so we all know what Kirk Cousins is capable of. Going into last season, to be honest, none of us knew really knew what Desmond Ritter was capable of or what he was going to do as the starter. So I really feel like this team. I can pretty much guarantee you guys, outside of an injury to Kirk Cousins, this Falcons team, as we just talked about, top 10 defenses, this will be a top 10 offense. You can book it. If as long as Kirk Cousins stays upright and we don't have like a bunch of injuries uh, to like guys like Kyle Pitts, Drake London, B. John Robinson, knock on wood, if we stay healthy on the offensive side of the ball, this will be a top 10 offense, a top 10 scoring offense with Kirk Cousins. This team will probably put up, I'll say they'll put up at least 20, at least 20, 21 to 25 points a game on average. They'll average at least 21 to 25 points a game with Kirk Cousins at the helm at the quarterback position. So I really feel like that's going to take a lot of pressure off the defense. Because if we be honest, last year's team, the defense outplayed the offense last year. In a lot of the games, a lot of our games were low scoring games. And that's because 
the offense wasn't doing their part. The defense pretty much carried us majority of the season. If you look at a lot of the games that we won, even early in the season, you had um, Jesse Bates coming up with numerous interceptions. That first game against the Panthers, he had three interceptions against the Saints. We were about to be down, I think, like 14 to zero or 10 to zero. But he picks off the ball and takes it back for a pick six. So that kind of swung the game in our, you know, the momentum in our favor. So if you look at most of the games last year, our defense kept us in every single game. The offense just underperformed for the for the players that we had and the talent that we had last year's offense underperformed because I don't believe we was even a top. I think we were like in the. Someone got to look it up for me. Y'all tell me what our offense ranked last year, but I know it wasn't good. It wasn't ranked higher than the defense. And we know all the weapons that we have on the offensive side of the ball. But I think the defense last year ranked higher than our offense, which is weird. And what's going on, Anthony? He said, what's good, Jew? I appreciate you joining me, man. And there it is right there. Dre Murphy just said it. The Falcons should just re-sign Calais before the Jaguars scoop him up. Ryan Nielsen is there and the Jaguars drafted uh, Campbell. Now, I don't think the, ja the Jaguars didn't draft him. He was drafted by Arizona, but he was in Arizona, I think, his first nine seasons or something like that. But he did play with Jacksonville. And if he decided that he wants to play one more year and he decides that he don't want to play for the Falcons, I could easily see him going – one more, you know, going south, <laughs> only one state over Georgia and Florida are right next to each other. So it's not like it's going to be a huge move if he decides to, you know, if he wants to play with the Jaguars, they're not far from uh, Atlanta. Jacksonville is not far from Atlanta. So but I hope that the Falcons, you know, he decides to choose to come back and play with the Falcons. And let's see, y'all start dropping y'all questions um, in the chat as well. Yeah, and I did. Uh, the JDS, so you actually got a knock on wood after that one, Jew. Yeah, I did. My my desk that um I do my shows in is made of wood. So every time I say knock on wood, I try to do it where you guys can't hear it. But yeah, I definitely knocked on some wood because I don't want to wish injury on nobody. But <laughs> but yeah, definitely. And Dre Dre Murphy says, Jew, I know you said we don't need a defensive tackle. But I still would take one with them two third round picks. We got um, we got me personally. I like and love uh, Byron Murphy and his running uh, mate Sweat out of Texas. Yeah, Sweat recently got arrested for a drunk driving or something like that. But you guys know that I like both of those guys, Sweat and Murphy. Uh, Byron Murphy is one of those guys that's really good. I think that everybody talks about Sweat more than Murphy. I think. Uh, sweat is just bigger like he's like 340 50 pounds something crazy like that but I think Murphy may turn out to be the better pro because Murphy is a guy not only that can stop the run but he's the guy that's similar to like a Grady Jarrett and he's considered like a pass rusher I don't know if I can say the same for a guy in sweat uh, sweat is really um you know sweat is really like a run stuffer He's not really a guy that I would expect to be a pass rusher. Now, he did have some plays last year where Murphy and Sweat together, they collapsed the pocket so much that they end up coming away with a couple sacks. But I really feel like um, Byron Murphy is the guy that I think if I had to choose between the two, I would take Byron Murphy over Sweat just for the mere fact that I think Byron Murphy could be a guy if Grady Jarrett somehow moves on, the Falcons will have a guy that can do similar things to a Grady Jarrett. Sweat, I like his game a lot as well, though, because he's a run stuffer, and I really feel like you can never have enough big bodies in the trenches. And that's one thing that I like about both Ryan Nielsen and I like currently what, um, you know, Jimmy Lake and Raheem Morris, what they're currently doing. I prefer bigger defense alignment in the trenches. I think it's just easier to plug up running lanes and things of that nature. And we know we had – um Dan Quinn here and Thomas Dimitrov, for whatever reason, they always wanted to draft smaller, you know, edge rushers, smaller defensive tackles. And that's why we got pushed around a lot. And if you notice last season, we didn't get pushed around a lot in the trenches. As far as being able to stop the run, 
our defense was really, really good at stopping the run last season. So I really feel like that's a huge plus. And you guys know when I always talk about the trenches, the main reason I always talk about the trenches is be not just to rush the passer, to be able to stop the run. Because if you can make a team one-dimensional, then you have a chance of winning a lot of football games. And I feel like last year we did a pretty solid job of making teams be one-dimensional. We just couldn't get off the field in certain instances. And then on the instances when the defense did get off the field, the offense didn't reward the defense by going down and scoring. So that's it works hand in hand. Like you can have a solid defense that gets stops, which is, you know, fine and dandy. But after your defense get a stop, you have to double up. and You have to reward your defense by having long drives and going down and scoring points. It was a lot of season, excuse me, a lot of instances last season where the defense gets a stop. The offense goes three and out and the, the defense is back out there on the field. And you can only expect your defense to hold up for so long before offenses figure them out or for the defense wears down. And then the team, the offense, opposing offense takes control of the game. So I really feel like the biggest issue last year with our team was when we got stops, our offense didn't take advantage of it and go out, go out there and score points. And I really feel like that's what made the 2016 Falcons team really good is we were one of the top teams in takeaways, but then we also was one of the highest scoring teams. So we put a lot of pressure on opposing offenses and opposing teams to keep up, which made other teams have to be one dimensional. So if you're facing a team like in that 2016 year, we would jump out to leads on teams and then our defense would turn around and get turnovers. And then Matt Ryan and offense would go down there and score touchdowns to put us up 10, 17, where teams then have to basically eliminate the running game because they're going to run out of time. They would have to throw the football, which makes it easier to rush the passer. When you know a team has to pass the ball because they're down double digits, at that point, your guys like Vic Beasley was able to pin his ears back. Guys like the White Freedney, Jonathan Babineau, those guys, Adrian Claiborne, they were able to pin their ears back. So I feel like this defense is going to be a lot similar to last year's, excuse me, similar to that 2016 team where I really feel like the offense is going to be so prolific where they're going to put up a lot of points. They're going to reward our defense for getting stops and turnovers because they're going to be able to cash in those stops for points. And when you do that, it forces, you know, the other team to be one dimensional and forced to try to keep up with your offense. So I really feel like that's the biggest, you know, the biggest reason why I think Kirk Cousins was a great signing is because now he's going to be that guy that's going to force teams to have to basically keep up. We're not going to have to rely on our offense to hold teams under 17 points, but we're going to be putting up, you know, 20 to 25 points a game. So that's going to make teams, it's going to put more pressure on the other opposing offense to keep up with us. It's going to force them to have to be one dimensional and not be able to just run the ball or be able to mix it up. They're going to have to basically throw the ball to keep up with our offense. And there it go right here. Man, Mike said scoring off opportunities were a major problem last year. It was a huge problem, especially being in the red zone. I don't know how many times the Falcons turned the ball over in the red zone. Interceptions, uh, fumbles by Ritter, fumbles by B. John Robinson at the wrong time. And when I talk about momentum and those three to four plays in the game that will win or lose you the game, nine times out of ten, the Falcons, we made a crucial mistake in big time moments and those were the difference between going 10 and 7 or going 7 and 10 when you make those you know bonehead mistakes and that's what pretty much killed us last year with those boneheaded mistakes and auntie pam says what do you think about i don't know if his name is bo limber a lemur Oh, this is a uh, uh, offensive tackle out of Arkansas. Now I haven't seen his uh his tape. I'm gonna have to check him out. I haven't really been looking at offensive line a whole lot, to be honest uh, with you, Miss Pam. I've been focused on defense, mainly the uh, defensive line, corners. Um, I really haven't been focused on the offensive line at all. Like I really haven't looked at this offensive line outside of uh, Joe Alt, which everybody talks about out of Notre Dame being like the top guy in the draft. I really haven't looked at any film. I haven't even looked at any film on Joe Alt, to be honest. I've been focused on the defense because our offensive line is pretty good. 
but I'll check him out just to see, you know, what he brings to the table because we know the Falcons at some point are going to have to start developing, you know, somebody behind Jake Matthews because we don't know how long Jake Matthews is going to want to play for. So I prefer having somebody already on the roster. Then Jake Matthews tells us I'm retiring. And then you got to go into the, the next draft and draft somebody to fill his shoes because those are going to be huge shoes to fill because we know that Jake Matthews has been one of those guys has been uh, one of the better left tackles since he stepped foot in the NFL. And Dre uh, Murphy says, uh, Dre Harrison, me personally, I'm trading back with Minnesota and get their 11th and 23rd first round picks. But Wallace Smith says he don't think they would trade with us because we got their quarterback. Um, I don't know. I feel like if they if they really want a quarterback and all of the quarterbacks are like coming off the board really quick, I think Minnesota ain't gonna have no no choice but to trade up because they got Sam Darnold right now as their starting quarterback, which I don't think that they want to rely on Sam Darnold. Now, there are rumors that Minnesota could play Sam Darnold this year and kind of tank or kind of just wait until next year because guys like Shador Sanders may come out. And they may just want somebody in the next draft. If I'm Minnesota personally, I'm not trading up or giving away all of my picks for one of these quarterbacks like to force it. Because I really don't feel like the bona fide guy is going to be there for them. I feel like they, they're they picking too low in the draft. I really think that most of the top guys are going to be gone. By the time we pick at eight, I really feel like the top quarterbacks, I think Caleb Williams is going to be gone. Jalen Daniels is going to be gone. The only one that may be still on the board at that time is like a McCarthy, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, maybe a Michael Penix might still be on the board. So they think that those guys are like franchise quarterbacks, then maybe. But outside of that, I think that all of them top guys that everybody keeps you know, talking about, I don't think that they're going to be there. <laughs> and Jamal D says, yo, what's going on, man? I appreciate you joining. He said, oh, Ken Folk Kurt. Yeah, that's what – uh." Uncle Shay call him. Uh, Shannon Sharp, he call him old Kenfo. <laughs> he call him second cousin. <laughs> and man, Mike says, we're going uh, we're going into the O-line conversation soon. Most definitely, yeah. Like I said, I haven't done a whole lot of, uh, you know, digging into this draft when it comes to offensive line because I feel like we've done a good job of developing our offensive line. But of course you develop or you draft in the trenches every year. As I mentioned with running backs, every year you should draft a running back. Every year you should draft offensive linemen. Every year you should draft defense linemen. Those are guys that you have to continue to continue to develop continuously. Those are like the three positions where I say you always draft because you can never have enough pass rush. You can never uh, have enough good offensive linemen because you don't want to get into a situation where, yes, we are good with the, the five guys that we have up front, but what happens is one of those guys go down, knock on wood again. But what happens if Drew Dahlman, what happens if Jake Matthews or one of those guys get injured, uh, Matthew Bergeron? You want to have a guy that you can plug and play. And I really feel like last year, Storm Norton did a really, really good job. And that's why they brought him back because Gary went down for a couple games and I couldn't even tell he was gone. Like Norton played really good. It was a lot of games where I looked up like who's number 77 because I didn't even realize that um McGarry had gotten hurt on a couple of those games and so I actually looked up and seen you know Storm Norton was playing really well and let's see and most definitely my bro says stay tuned for the heavy hitters subscribe to the channel every post uh, game live will be there most definitely we do all of our post game shows on the heavy hitter channel and on Wednesday nights um me Mad Mike K Styles Don, we go live. We talk about different um, topics, not just Atlanta Falcons topics, but we also talk about NFL breaking news and things of that nature. Last week, we talked about Stefan Diggs to the Texans. So you guys are definitely going to want to go and check that out um, as well. <laughs> and Red Swamp says, I agree with you, Jude. Jake Matthews' wife is cranking those babies out. Jake going to want to have family time in a few years. Uh, most definitely. He's going to be like Matt Ryan pretty soon. Like he's going to need time. And, you know, as your kids start to grow up, you, you want to be there. Once his kids start playing football or soccer or whatever, they're, you know, whatever activities his kids get into, they're going to want to, 
you know, they're going to want to, he wants, he's going to want to be present. So I can definitely agree with that. Now his father played, I think almost close to 20 years. Uh, but I don't know if he's going to want to stick around for that long, but hopefully we can get back to a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl before it's all said and done. Cause Jake Matthews, to me, quietly, he's had a really good career. He doesn't get talked about enough as one of the better offensive linemen, especially playing in the you know the quarterback's blind spot. The left tackle position is one of the top, I'll say the top five positions as far as most important. And he's been one of those guys that you don't hear his name called a, a whole lot during games, which means he's doing his job. And JDS says the position we're in right now is a good trade back spot. Just going to have to hope a quarterback or one of the top wide receivers are there. Yeah, we're in a good position. We're in a good position. I mean, Minnesota, you know, I could see them trading up. They really want a quarterback, but I feel like we should just pick where we at. I keep hearing we should trade back and I don't mind trading back, but those three pass rushers better be there. If they're not there, then I'm taking, you know, I'm taking my guy at eight. I'm not waiting because we know that teams will trade up and then draft the guy that you wanted. So I, I don't want to have no regrets. If you know who you want, stand 10 toes down on it. I don't feel, I keep hearing that eight is too high, you know, for one of these edge guys. Personally, I don't, I don't think that. I feel like you got to go with whoever you want. And let's see here. And JDS says O line probably in the fourth round uh pick, maybe, or one of the third rounds. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, like I said, we definitely gotta take a we definitely gotta take a um offensive lineman in this draft. I wouldn't, I would not uh come away from this draft with as many picks as we have. I think the Falcons gotta draft at least one offensive lineman just to be developing, you know, behind the guys that we have. But like I said, you never know when an injury may may strike. And Falcons for life says uh, Kevin King, uh, we better off paying Okuda. Uh, but Okuda got more money. Okuda signed a one-year deal, but I think Okuda got like one year, five. I think he got like five to $10 million, if I'm not mistaken, from the Houston Texans. So I think that they wouldn't have mind keeping Jeff Okuda, but I think that they didn't want to pay Jeff Okuda the money would have it would have took to keep him. Kevin King, you're paying him veteran minimum. I think they're paying him like, one mil, no more than about one to two million dollars a year. So I think it was just Okuda was just a little bit too rich for our price range at this point, a little too rich for our blood at this point, because we still got other guys that we got to we got to pay. Plus, we got to pay the draft class. And then you pay Kirk Cousins. I keep saying we paid Kirk Cousins a big, you know, a big part of that money went to Kirk Cousins. And let's see. So Jamal D says, yes, sir. Ready for this season to start. Kick them ain'ts between the, between the washer and dryer. Most definitely. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, the Saints, we owe the Saints for the, how the last game ended with them scoring a touchdown in Neil formation, basically in victory formation. They ran it, ran, uh, I think it was Jamal Williams, if I'm not mistaken, is his name. The Saints running back end up scoring a touchdown, which was his only touchdown of the season. I'm like, really? Y'all gonna really run a fake, <laughs> a fake Neil uh, running back dive? Come on! And it was already up by like a hundred points. Come on, man! And JDS says if Roma Dunze is there at eight, do y'all think Terry will pass him up? <laughs> I think he will. I think he will. I mean, at this point, if Roma Dunze is there, I'm passing him up. And I know that sounds crazy, but if Roma Dunze is there, and Latu was there, and Dallas Turner is there, and Jerry Ver I'm taking one of those guys. I'll even go this far. If Roma Dunze is there, and only one of those pass rushers out of Latu, Dallas Turner, and Verse is there, I'm taking one of those three. I'm taking one of the three pass rushers before I'm taking Roma Dunze. At some point, the Falcons got to just learn that there's always going to be good wide receivers. When we were drafting the year that C.D. Lamb came out, we were on the board. I think that was the year we took – that was either the year we took – I think that was the year we took Kyle Pitts, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was the year we took Kyle Pitts or Drake London. I can't remember. I think it was the year we took Kyle Pitts, if I'm not mistaken. 
But CeeDee Lamb was there, and the Falcons went with Kyle Pitts. So, I mean, they're always going to be good wide receivers available. I'm sure when we draft at eight, one of those guys' top receivers are going to be there. Uh, Malik Neighbors, uh, Marvin Harrison, Roma Dunze. They got like three or four good wide receivers that are at, in, at the top of that draft board. But a couple of those guys, at least two to three, to, I see at least two of those guys will still be on the board at eight. But I don't feel like the Falcons should take them. I feel like they should go with an edge rusher. And I kind of want to get you guys' thoughts, too, because I keep saying trade back. Like I, I heard I would trade back and then take Latu. But what if you trade back and then somebody drafts them? That's my. That's what I'm scared of. I don't mind trading back, but my logic is if you trade back, it's not a guarantee that when you trade back that they're going to just lead a player you want so you can still take them when you want to take them. So <laughs> I don't get that. I get the logic of wanting extra picks, but I, we cannot guarantee that he's going to – that our guy's going to be there. So that's my biggest fear of I'm not trading back. Trey Murphy says, out of the South Carolina Gamecocks and the second wide receiver I like out of Florida, Ricky Pearsall, bro, <laughs> you can get one of them in the later rounds. Yeah, Ricky Pearsall is good too. I've been watching some of his film. I'm going to do a breakdown on his game because he's one of those guys that would fit perfectly in his scheme. Run after catch. Um, a guy that runs really, really crisp routes, similar to a lad McConkey. So, yeah, if you want a, a wide receiver, there's going to there's court uh, running, excuse me, wide receivers galore in this draft. You, you can get I can go 10 to 15 deep as far as just names of wide, wide receivers that I've watched film. And I'm like, yeah, this dude will work. <laughs> and I keep telling you guys, Puka Natua was, I think, a fourth, fifth, something like that. He was not drafted high at all. And he. He blew everybody out the water as far as in the rookie, his rookie class, as far as him, his receiving yards, he broke all of the records for receiving yards for a rookie wide receiver. And uh, Puka for the L.A. Rams, which is playing in this same scheme that Zach Robinson's going to be running, he had a really good season. So you don't need a top wide receiver. We don't need another wide receiver. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mike says, no more wide receivers. Exactly. We good. I mean, we can draft one. I'm fine with drafting one. I'm just not taking no more wide receivers in the first round. I don't I don't see a reason it's not necessary. At this point, it's just overload because when you take a, fir a first round wide receiver, I need a, him to be a, like the number one dude. And you took that dude in Drake London. When we took Drake London, we didn't have a number one wide receiver. When we took Cal uh, Pitts, if you guys remember, because we lost Calvin Ridley and we lost Julio, we really didn't have any wide receivers or like top pass catching weapons. But at this point, we good. Oh, Falcons for Life said Lamb was there when we took AJ Terrell. OK, yeah. Well, I, like I said, I know he was there and we was like, nah, because we needed a corner at that time. So, right. And Mike loves his a Makonky, Makonky. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. So we're gonna get ready to wrap it up here, man. Y'all give me drop a couple more questions in the chat because it's not quite 12 o'clock, but I'm gonna be getting off here in a couple minutes. Y'all drop y'all questions. If I didn't get a chance to answer your questions, put it back in the uh chat because I might have not seen it as I was scrolling through. He says Titans take a tackle leaves us perfect leverage for a trade back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm not opposed to trading back, but my guy better, our guy better be there. If you trade him back, y'all better know that whoever's picking behind you that's trading up, they don't want who you trying to you trading back for, or you trading back. Yeah, you better hope they don't want the guy that you're trading while you're trading back, basically. J.D. says, if we trade back, I think we'll target a cornerback over edge unless Versalatu is there, maybe even Dallas, <laughs> depending on how far back we trade. Yeah, I mean, the, I'll say this. If the Falcons don't go defensive line, which I feel like at this point they better, but if they don't, the only thing that I'm okay with them taking in the first round is corner 
The only reason I'll say corner is because if they don't know if they're going to pay AJ Terrell, they may be drafting a guy that they think can take over and be the number one corner. So I can condone that. I can't condone any position on the offensive side of the ball outside of left tackle. Like if they're saying, okay, Jake Matthews, we know something that everybody else don't know. I can see, okay, we can go with a left tackle. I can condone that. And outside of that, I can't condone nothing else over an edge rusher or a pass rusher. So if, unless we're taking CB1 or CB1 of the future, or unless they're taking a left tackle that's going to be here for the next couple of years, I'm staying where I'm at. I'm not moving back. I'm taking the a edge rusher. Those are the only two positions I can condone. And then I can make uh, one exception or an exception for quarterback. That's the only other position. And for that particular um, position, it better be somebody that they think is like the future franchise guy. I'm not trading back or, you know, drafting a quarterback in the first round if I don't think that he's the next Matt Ryan or the heir apparent to Kirk Cousins. Because I can condone even you taking a quarterback if you really think that, okay, Michael Penix, and you got a plan for it, or one of these guys, you know, slide in the draft and you really, really think that they're the next, you know, next quarterback for the Falcons. That's the only other other position I can condone. But outside of those three positions, I can't condone a linebacker, just a, a inside linebacker. I can't condone a safety because you're really set with Jesse Bates and Helms. Um, I can't condone a guard because you got two good offensive guards. You definitely can't condone a, a center being taken in the first round because you see so many years where you can you can make do at center. You always can find a center. Unless this guy's generational. I've seen guys like Kelsey who just retired was like a fifth round pick for the Eagles and end up being a Hall of Famer. So you can find talent later on in the draft for those type of positions. So the only position I think I can condone is cornerback, left tackle, and a quarterback if you have some type of plan where you just feel like this is a can't miss prospect. We need this guy because Kirk Cousins is on the back half of his career, and we don't want to be chasing after Kirk Cousins is, you know, done playing. We want somebody to be able to develop under him where we're not chasing like we were when Matt Ryan left and or was traded, and then we didn't have a guy that was ready to go. So those are only three positions I can um I can condone personally. Let's see. All right, so I think I hear everybody's questions here. Let's see. All right, so I think I hear each and every one of you guys' questions, man. But I appreciate you guys joining. Um, as I mentioned, you guys stay tuned because I'm gonna have a lot more content coming for you guys as always. Um, as I mentioned, it's a busy, uh, busy, busy month for me. Uh, anniversary coming up at the end of the month. Uh, my birthday's Thursday. Um, my son's birthday's Thursday. So. Yeah, the Aries is in the building, but I appreciate each and every one of you guys for your continued support. Continue to like, share, subscribe to Jew Talk Sports, uh, heavy hitters. Y'all definitely go over and hit that like and subscribe button for us uh, over there as well. Um, but I'll keep pumping out this content for you guys. But as always, Falcons Nation, rise up, be blessed, peace. Y'all have a great rest of your week.